Welcome to today's webinar and a very happy new year to you all. My name is Sarah Gary, I'm the Executive Officer of the British Society of Soil Science and I'm delighted to welcome you all to our first webinar of 2022. Today's event is co-organised by the British Society of Soil Science and the British Ecological Society. And before I welcome our panellists, I'd like to introduce the British Society of Soil Science as hosts of today's webinar. We are an established international membership organisation and charity committed to the study of soil in its widest aspects. And we bring together those working within academia and have a growing membership amongst practitioners implementing soil science and industry and those with a keen interest in soils. This year, we'll be running eight Zoom into soil webinars with the next one taking place on Wednesday, the 2nd of February, and with a focus on soils in Scotland. Uh, sponsored by Visit Britain, the webinar will also look ahead to the World Congress of Soil Science, which we're hosting on behalf of the International Union of Soil Sciences from the 31st of July to the 5th of August in Glasgow. As I mentioned, today's event has been organised in collaboration with the British Ecological Society, and I'd like to welcome Daniela Rusi, who's the Senior Policy Manager for the Society, to give a brief introduction to BES. Thanks, Daniela, and over to you. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everybody. Um, so my name is Daniela Russi. I'm the senior policy manager of the British Ecological Society. Uh, I've been asked to say a few words on the BS. So uh, the BS is the oldest and largest scientific society for ecologists in Europe. We have about 7,000 members in 122 countries around the world, and we support ecologists uh, at all stages of their career. We have eight journals to help share the results of ecological research and also we have grants and we carry out education and policy work. Um, so please feel free to have a look at our web page if you want to know more about our work. And I also want to say we are very grateful to the British Society of Soil Science for organizing this webinar. We are delighted to work with you on such an interesting and important topic. And actually, the policy team is planning to produce a report on the topic later this year. So please feel free to get in touch with us if you want to be involved. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniela. That was a really great introduction. Uh, we've also been supported today by one of our corporate members, ADAS, and I'd like to welcome John Williams very briefly uh, for a brief introduction. Welcome, John. Thanks, very, to much. You. Thanks very much, Shara. Um, I'm John Williams. I head up the Soils and Nutrients Group in ADAS, and I'm delighted that we are now a corporate member of the Society. Uh, for those of you who don't know much about ADAS, uh, we are an independent research and advisory business based in the UK, covering all aspects of soil, land and agricultural management. We were originally set up as the extension service for the Ministry of Agriculture many moons ago, where we carried out research and provided advice to farmers to mainly improve production. But um, as government policies changed, we were privatised in 1997 and our soils research focus move very much to providing the evidence base for policies to improve soil, air and water quality, whilst obviously in increasing the efficiency of agricultural production. Uh, ADAS and the Society have actually grown up together, having both recently celebrated 75th birthdays. Many of our soil scientists are members, and chartered scientists and past and present colleagues have been council members and presidents of the Society. Uh, we have benefited from attendance at conferences, the society's conferences, and from the information provided by the journals. And um, yeah, certainly from a personal perspective, it's been great being a member over, over several decades. Um, we've also contributed to many of the society's activities, including the recent Soil Carbon Note, which Anne Begal, uh, our presenter later on this, this afternoon, and Paul Neil Price have helped with. Um, we look forward to continuing to working together, and there's no better way to start than this afternoon's session on a very relevant and important topic. Thanks very much, Sarah. Thank you so much. Uh, before we begin, just some basic housekeeping. As there are so many of you here today, all your microphones have been muted. We will be taking the questions at the end of both today's presentations, and my colleague Chris will monitor these for us. Please do try to submit any questions you have before 12.50 uh, to allow us to get through as many as we can. 
although there is a raise your hand button, we won't be using this unless the presenter specifically asks for a show of hands. Today's presentation has also been awarded basis and NROSO points, uh, so if you're registered with either body, please contact us directly after the event uh, for information about how to collect your CPD. Finally, please be aware that we are recording today's presentation. So without further ado, I'd now like to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Anne Bogal. Anne is a principal soil scientist at ADAS, and she's involved in the research and development of policies on soil and nutrient management. She has a particular interest in the impact of organic amend amendments and cover cropping on soil quality, carbon storage and nutrient cycling. She's currently leading the field experimentation program of the AHDB Soil Biology and Health Partnership. She's facts qualified uh, and a fellow of the British Society of Soil Science. So without further ado, over to you, Anne. Thank you very much, Sarah. I'll just sort of sharing my screen. Oh, I'm I think I've shared the wrong one. Can we do it again? <laughs> we can see your main screen, Anne, if that helps. You can see me, can you? I, we can see you and we can see your, your presentation. Oh, can you see this one over here? Right. I can I can see pictures of tractors and the title of your Soil Organic Matter cool. talk. As, as a full screen, that's great, so we can get started. Thank you very much, that's great. Okay, so yes, thank you for the opportunity to speak about Regen Ag, and in particular, I'm hoping to show that this is fundamentally about maintaining and improving soil organic matter. So over the next 20 minutes or so, I'm gonna briefly look at what we mean by regenerative agriculture. We'll look at soil health and the importance of soil organic matter and consider soil organic matter levels in UK soils. And then finally look at ways in which to maintain and improve soil organic matter and how these ways are very much aligned with the five principles of regenerative agriculture. So what do we mean by regenerative agriculture? It's very much a uh, buzzword at, at the moment. Um, and if we just look at what's been published in the last year on the subject, numerous papers and articles across a range of sectors, we can see how um, widespread the interest is. So if we take a look at the academic uh, press, a paper here by Ken Giller last year talks about regen agriculture be a, being a reframing of two approaches, agroecology, and sustainable intensification. Then if we look at the, the popular farming press, what the farmers are reading, um, we see uh, regen agriculture being talked about from a more practical perspective, how to go about it. And then it's even reached the mainstream national press here, The Guardian in July last year, um, defined uh, regenerative agriculture as any farming practice that at the same time improved the environment. Um, but if we strip it back, what does regenerate mean? It means to renew or restore something that has uh, been lost or degraded. So from an agricultural perspective, regenerative agriculture is very much about improving and restoring soil health and biodiversity on the farm. And this is principally through uh, well-established sustainable soil management practices. So we see soil health being at its core. So again, very much a, a buzzword of recent years. And I like this definition of soil health uh, the best as it recognizes uh, soils as a living system. So it recognizes the importance of soil biology but it also recognises that we need to think about the function the soil is going to be delivering. And in this case, it's food production. So those, those soil functions we also find are actually ultimately largely driven by biological processes. And those biological processes themselves are underpinned 
by soil organic matter decomposition. So we see that soil organic matter is very much the major currency within the soil system. It's uh, an indicator of soil health and it's the sort of the fuel, the food source for the soil biology, which in turn drives nutrient cycling, but is also uh, very important for the development of good soil structure through the sticking together of soil particles and the development of pores which in turn is important for the flow and movement and retention of water, but not forgetting also that organic matter is a really important carbon store and therefore involved in the regulation of climate. So we see that soils with a higher organic matter content have improved structure and water holding and infiltration rates, improved um, biological activity and nutrient turnover. This in turn will lead to better rooting and water capture by the crops, reduced runoff and erosion and water logging, which ultimately leads to improved productivity, greater resilience um, uh, within the soil system, um, lower risk of flooding and lower emissions to the environment which obviously ultimately leads to um, reduced costs. But uh, how do we know what is a good level of organic matter within a soil? How do we know if our soils are degraded and need regenerated? What is the scope for improvement? And so defining what a critical level of organic matter is has been the sort of the subject of much research over the years and um, really the conclusion has been that there is no absolute value and it very much depends on where you are and your soil type and what we can say is there's a range of typical values that we would expect to um, to to see depending largely on clay content but also on rainfall and this is from a UK perspective so this um, this data is from a national soil survey in the UK looking at how soil organic carbon um, but for that we can uh, we can infer soil organic matter um, uh, varies with clay content so you can see this is for an arable arable soils in dry areas of the UK so over towards the east of the country you can see these typical ranges these envelopes within which you would expect soils um, to sit those envelopes increasing with in, um, increasing clay content if we move over to the west of the country where it's wetter you can see those ranges shift up a bit and then likewise, if we put grass down, they shift up even further. We've got permanent vegetative cover uh, and litter inputs going in roots that are present all the time. And so what we can do is we can uh, benchmark where a soil sits within these ranges. And so we've been doing this uh, with AHDB and BBR as part of the Soil Biology and Health Partnership Programme. We've simplified it somewhat just dividing it into three different textual groups. And then we basically um, scored soils um, using a very simple traffic light system, saying basically, if you are, um, your soil is sort of in the middle of the range, average or above, actually you've got a fairly decent amount of organic matter in your soil. You probably don't need to change management practice, just continue to monitor the situation. However, if you're, um, below average, but still within that range, we would give it an amber flag. But obviously, if you're um, completely outside the range and you're at, at the lower level, then there is scope for improvement. And then maybe those are the soils and the soil types where regenerative practices would be beneficial. So how do we go about increasing organic matter content within soils? Very simple, a schematic of of carbon and, and how it moves and where it comes from. On the one hand, we could increase inputs, so livestock uh, manure returns, vegetative returns, root returns, residue returns. 
On the other side, we can try and reduce losses, um, uh, respiration losses and losses through dissolved organic matter, sediment associated organic matter to surface and ground waters. But before we look at some of the practices that might do this, we need to also consider how soil organic matter changes over time as a result of introducing different practices. And what we see is that for a majority of soils where management hasn't changed for a considerable length of time, they will be at an equilibrium. They will be at a fairly constant organic matter con content where inputs are equaling outputs. And it's only where we change management. So in this case, um, for example, increase our inputs or slow down decomposition that we'll start to see a change in that organic matter content. That change will initially be reasonably rapid, but as we approach a new equilibrium, that rate of change will decline. And so this whole transition can take anything up to 100 years with that initial uh, more rapid phase uh, occurring over, say, a 20 year period. But also what we also need to be aware of that there is a finite capacity for soils to accumulate organic matter and also we can reverse anything that we do and often when we stop a practice we can see um, uh, organic matter decline much more quickly than actually we were able to build it up with in the first place. So now if we look at the various practices to improve organic matter in soils, for croplands, we, could, we can introduce rotational grass, apply organic materials, use cover crops, green manures, incorporate residues, um, adopt reduced or no-till practices, and also look at ways in which we can mitigate and, and control erosion so we don't get that sediment associated organic matter loss. For grasslands, first and foremost, for permanent grasslands, it's, it's important that we don't disturb them. Any, any cultivation and, and, and conversion of grassland back to arable will see big losses in organic matter. As with croplands, applying organic materials, reducing uh, erosion um, have, has benefit for organic matter levels. And then the subject of grazing management. I put a question mark here um, as I think we're still trying to understand what is the optimum and the best type of grazing um, to be able to enhance organic matter uh, within soils. Likewise, increasing the diversity of the soil, there's some evidence that that is going to, uh, that improves soil organic matter, um, but still work to be done. And I'm hoping that Richard, who's going to follow me on this talk, will, will talk about this a little bit more detail. Now, what we see is actually these practices, these well-established practices, are really a, a much, very much aligned to the principles of regenerative agriculture. This is a really nice uh, schematic produced by Groundswell Agriculture. It was produced as a tea towel for all those who attended last year, um, uh, just outlining those five principles. So the first one being to minimize soil disturbance, so adopting no-till agriculture, keeping the soil covered throughout the year, um, using cover crops ahead of spring cropping and maintaining living roots in the ground for, for as much of the year as possible. Um, diversifying the rotation so that you have broad rotation, not monocropping, um, lots of different crops grown in rotation and in particular bringing in rotational lays and introducing livestock onto those lays and also grazing of cover crops. So we can see that those are very much aligned with those practices that I outlined previously. So if we just look at some of the evidence behind some of these, just briefly from a UK perspective, so minimizing soil disturbance, well established that this enhances soil biology, you're not disrupt, disrupting um, the habitats. 
and evidence that it increases, and I've underlined surface organic matter levels in particular. There's some evidence to suggest that actually um, the, the overall topsoil or profile organic matter content doesn't change compared to, a, say, a plough-based system. What we're doing is changing where the organic matter is within the profile. So that increase in surface organic matter being beneficial in terms of um, establishing, a, 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 a creating a good seabed and, and establishing a, a crop. So we did some work for DEFRA quite a few years back now, looking at UK long-term experiments that had looked at zero tillage compared to conventional tillage and measured organic matter changes over time. And this is the average change in organic matter that we, we saw across these experiments, fairly small, so about half a ton per hectare per year change and quite variable with some sites showing no change or even a decline. And this being very uh, quite, a, when we look at it in proportion to what is already in the topsoil, we see that it's less than half a percent of what's already in. So in terms of carbon stock, very small, but in terms of concentration, yes, important for those knock-on effects on soil biology. Keeping the soil covered and maintaining living roots, a lot of evidence out there for many years demonstrating that cover crops are excellent at minimizing nitrate leaching, retaining nitrogen within the soil system and uh, uh, helping alleviate soil erosion. So keeping the soil covered over that critical time period over winter. Um, increasingly, we're, we're seeing evidence for benefits for soil structure, water holding capacity, porosity. But I would say there's a limited evidence of the uh, benefit of cover crops on the bulk soil organic matter content. Just a bit of evidence here from some work we did with AHD a couple of years back looking at benefits to, to, to soil structure and biological activity. This is work with farmers on farm uh, in a series of uh, tramline trials. Here looking at penetration resistance, the control being no cover crop, a uh, very simple cover crop, two species in a mix, mix one, versus a more complex five species mix. And you can see where we had those cover crop mixes, penetration resistance in the spring uh, was lower compared to having no um, cover crop, particularly uh, between 10 and 20 centimetres depth. We also looked at earthworms as an indicator of biological activity, and we actually measured them a year after the cover crops had been in, so actually in the winter crop. And we saw that actually, yes, increasing, uh, it, having a, a cover crop present increased earthworm numbers, but also increasing the diversity of that cover crop increased earthworm numbers even further. Briefly, diversifying the rotation and introducing grass and livestock, basically having grass present, uh, a living crop there the whole uh, of the year, minimising soil disturbance, returning litter, but also returning manure to the soils. Um, where better to go than some of the long-term Rothamsted experiments to look and see how different land uses affect soil organic matter? This is some um, results from David Polson. Three fields, high field was a grassland, either stayed grassland or went into arable rotation or bare fallow. And you can see clearly that the grassland was pretty much at equilibrium, um, amounts of organic matter, rapid decline in uh, concentrations um, as a result of the arable rotation, but having nothing present, even a more significant decline. Foster's was the opposite. It was an arable rotation that went into grassland. Again, slight decline in the arable rotation, but probably reaching equilibrium levels here too. Whereas putting grassland down and permanent grassland, um, clear benefits for soil organic matter. And then Woburn went from an arable rotation to a lay arable, three years of grass, and you can see small increases in organic matter content as a result of having that lay present. And then finally, just touch on organic materials 
These are an ex excellent source of organic matter, whether they're from on farm, so having livestock on your farm, cattle FYM, or whether they're external sources such as compost being brought into the farm. In particular, these bulky or um, high dry matter materials supplying anywhere between three and five tonnes per hectare of organic matter um, at recommended um, application rates. But do all these materials have the same effects on soil properties? Are some better than others in terms of improving soil functioning? We did some work for RAP uh, looking at particularly at digestate and compost, but including other livestock manures in the comparison. And this is just a summary of a number of long-term experiments looking at a range of different organic materials and how they change topsoil organic matter content, um, percentage change relative to a control treatment which received no um, uh, organic material additions. And I particularly want you to draw your attention to the green compost that was applied repeatedly for nine years compared to the farmyard manure, which was repeatedly applied for 20 years. You can see that although we supplied lower amounts of organic matter with the green compost, the change in organic matter content of the soil was the same as where we'd applied more um, FYM. And this is down to the stability um, of those different materials, the stability of the carbon within those different materials, with much of the decomposition of carbon um, uh, occurring in the compost heap before the material is applied, compared to a farmyard manure, which is a much more um, deco decomposable source of carbon. And interestingly, when we looked at the knock on effect on uh, soil biology, Oh, yeah, this is set. Sorry, oh, five minutes, a few more minutes, Sarah. Um, we can see that um, actually the response is different. So the green compost, that stable material, increases all um, biological activity, but not to the same degree as applying a much more readily available uh, material. And this has consequences for soil physical functioning. So this is bulk density we would uh, expect bulk density to decrease where we've got higher organic matter levels. And it does, yes, with green compost, but where we've got this bulk biologically active material, the decrease is greater. So to conclude, just very brief uh, bullet points. I hope I've demonstrated that regen agricultural practices are really all about sustainable soil organic matter management, with organic matter underpinning those functions that soils deliver. But I would caution and, uh, and note that it's important to consider the wider implication of any organic matter management practices um, to ensure that they um, don't have any uh, environment, other environmental impacts, so that we minimise those environmental impacts. And that is it. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you so much, Anne. That was incredibly interesting. Um, just from my own personal perspective, as an allotment holder, uh, just reviewing that the stats you have on green manure and farmyard manure, I know which I'll be using uh, going forward. So thank you. Incredibly useful. Uh, we'll be taking questions for both speakers at the end of today's session. So if you do have any questions for Anne, please drop them into the questions box. Uh, and our next speaker is Professor, Professor Richard Bargett. Uh, Richard is Professor of Ecology at the University of Manchester, and his research interests are focused on understanding how soil biodiversity regulates the functioning of natural and agricultural ecosystems, uh, with a particular focus on grasslands. More recently, his re research on soils and their ecology has been directed at issues such as sustainable soil management, biodiversity restoration, and climate mitigation. Uh, Richard has a very impressive CV and currently is a member of DEFRA's Science Advisory Council. He served as president of the British Ecological Society uh, and on several advisory boards, including BBSRC's Research Advisory Panel and the Rothamsted Board of Directors. Um, over to you, Richard. 
Hello. Hopefully. Hi, Richard. We can hear you, but we can't see you yet. You can hear me okay? We can hear you perfectly, but we can't see you yet. Oh, okay. Should, should I just start anyway, because we, with, in view of time? That would be super. If you could share your screen for us, that would be great. And I'm sure Natalie will send you another webcam you invite. Go. Ah, I think it's come on. Okay, well, thank, thank you very much for um, asking to give this presentation. Um, I think that's, has that included that's, it? That's, that's wonderful, we can see you, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, well, thank you very much for the invitation to give this uh, presentation. Uh, Anne's given a, an excellent overview, really, an introduction to some of the aspects I'm going to be talking about, because I, I really want to focus on a specific aspect of regenerative agriculture, which is the role of biodiversity. Um, rather like Anne, one of the first things I did when I was asked to give this presentation was, was ask the question essentially what is regenerative agriculture because to be honest I was pretty unsure myself when I was first uh, looking into the actual topic and I think some key things emerged from that I actually talked to quite a few colleagues about this as well and it seems that I think as Anne has also pointed out it's not widely used in the academic literature but it is becoming increasingly prominent among policymakers, practitioners, and it's also mentioned in the press, as uh, Anne also mentioned. There also seem to be numerous different definitions. It obviously means different things to different people, and these are based on practices such as tillage, minimal use of fertilizers, but also some are very much based on the actual outcomes of regenerative agriculture, for example, in relation to improving soil health. But I think one thing that really so sort of unifies many of the actual definitions and the way that people use the term is that it's actually moving beyond what might be considered non-degrading or sustainable farming to one that is more based on actually enhancing or regenerating the actual system and the definition which i'm, I'm sort of going to use which is one which uh, it was actually jim harris who passed on a report to me that they'd written at cranfield and it's basically a system of principles and practices so it comp binds the principles and practices that generates products, sequesters carbon, enhances biodiversity at the farm scale. And as we've already heard from Anne, there are a whole range of practices associated with regenerative agriculture. And the one I really want to focus on in this presentation is fostering plants, and I put in brackets, and soil biodiversity. Now, Anne talked a lot about soil organic matter and how it's absolutely central to the health of soil. It underpins the biodiversity, it's important for aggregate stability and water retention, and also the cycling and availability of nutrients. Now, what I really want to focus here is the idea that biodiversity is not just an outcome of regenerative agriculture, but it's also key to the regeneration and maintenance of soil health. Obviously, all these different physical chemical and biological factors are strongly interrelated and they're very much underpinned by organic matter. But I want to focus here very much on biodiversity and how we can actually foster biodiversity within regenerative agriculture for benefits for soil health and the overall functioning of the system. So what I'm going to do is really focus on my own research and that of my colleagues and really provide evidence from specific situations to address three different points. I'm going to address the point that promoting soil biodiversity is integral to ecosystem functioning and also regenerative agriculture. I want to make the point that plant and soil biodiversity and all the benefits that they bring are actually strongly interrelated. And I think this is important for management because the suggestion is that you can modify diversification, plant diversity, in a way which brings benefits for soil diversity and hence the functioning of the soil system. And the point I want to finish on at the end, which I, I'm pleased that Anne brought this up, which was the question of grazers, because they're often neglected, certainly in grassland systems, as a key modulator of biological processes and the functioning of soil. And I think Anne made the point that we lack a lot of understanding about what the optimum grazing should be in systems. And essentially that's a point that I want to also emphasize at the end of this talk. So, I'm just trying to move my talk on. 
So moving to the, the, the first part, I think one thing that's become increasingly clear over the last two, three decades is that soils harbour a vast diversity of organisms. Now, most of the focus is very much on the microorganisms, the bacteria and fungi, but actually the soil community is made up of a web of different organisms which actually compose the food web, which is critical to the functioning of the soil system. Another thing that's becoming increasingly apparent is that the diversity and composition of those food webs is highly sensitive to human interventions, in particular changes in land use, but also changes in the intensity of management. And this is just one example. This is a study which I was involved in across a broad range of sites across Europe. And at different sites in different countries, there were gradients of management intensity, ranging from extensive grassland systems right through to intensive arable systems. And what was really striking across all those sites when we sampled them was that there was a consistent pattern of intensive agriculture, arable agriculture, reducing the number of different functional groups within a food web, but also reducing the diversity of the entire food web and the diversity of organisms within the individual groups of organisms. So in other words, as shown in these data here, across that broad range of sites, intensive agriculture essentially simplifies the complexity of the soil food web. Now, many different studies have looked at the consequences of soil biodiversity for ecosystem function, and the results are actually quite variable depending on how you actually go about studying the diversity and how it affects different functions. But I think one thing that's becoming abundantly clear is that if you reduce the complexity of the soil food web, reducing the numbers of different trophic groups, the species within those trophic groups, you can impair the functioning of that system. This is just one example. This is a study that was produced some years ago by a group within Switzerland by Cameron Wag leading the paper. And what they did was di actually manipulate the diversity of the whole food web based on body size. And what they can show, as you've seen in this graph here, is that a decline in the complexity and diversity of the food web led to a decline in multifunctionality. Multifunctionality is basically a range of simultaneous functions operating in the soil which would be key to soil health and crop production. So I think there's now ample evidence, I would say, that declines in the complexity and diversity of soil food webs resulting from agriculture in particular are actually detrimental to the functioning of the soil. I think the other thing that was becoming clear that it's not just the diversity of those organisms, it's also the structure of the food webs. And one of the things that I've been working on with colleagues for many years now is the idea that soil food webs are split into what we call fungal and bacterial food webs. And essentially, intensive agriculture shifts the food web to a less diverse and complex system, as I've already shown, but also one that's dominated by bacteria, the consumers of bacteria, and also their predators. Conversely, more extensive Low input systems tend to have more fungal dominated systems. Now, what we did in this study was test how that impacted on the resistance and resilience of the food web and also the processes it drives, like nitrogen and carbon cycling, in response to climate extremes, in particular to drought, which is increasing in frequency and intensity. And what we found was quite striking that basically more complex fungal based food webs which are typical of extensive systems, sensitive grasslands in this case, were actually more resistant to drought and mitigated carbon and nitrogen losses through the food web. Losses from nitrogen leaching, respiration, and nitrous oxide production. So in other words, intensive agriculture shifts the system to one which is more bacterial dominated, less complex and less diverse, and a consequence is the resistance of that food web is impaired in terms of its capacity to mitigate carbon and nitrogen losses. So in other words, hope these are just two examples, but hopefully it suggests at least that diversity in the soil and the complexity of the food web, not just the bacterial fungi, the whole food web is critical to the functioning of soil. 
Now, hopefully having established that, that would suggest that if you can enhance the diversity of these food webs and their complexity, there could be benefits for the functioning of soil. And this has been a, a focus of research that we've been doing for some years now, in particular, focusing on restoring degraded soil systems, whether degraded through things like overgrazing or degraded through agricultural intensification. For example, arable, exarable farming. And it's generally known in sort of plant ecology, at least, that there are benefits of plant diversity for yield stability, pest suppression and weed suppression. And one of the things that we've been interested in studying, as have other people, is how changes or increases in plant diversity, particularly in grassland systems, can improve the diversity of the soil, but also the functioning of that soil system. And I think the key point to make here, and I don't have time to go into it, is that there are many different mechanisms by which plant diversity can enhance or influence the organisms in the soil and also processes of organic matter dynamics. But evidence from a range of studies tends to point to higher diverse systems, particularly in grasslands, of having multiple benefits for the soil. These are just three specific examples. The first one on the left hand side is one that we did where we showed that higher diversity grassland systems, we had all different mixtures of all different plant species, up to six species, were generally associated with higher root biomass and also allocation to beneficial microorganisms, in particular mycorrhizal fungi in the soil. There have also been studies done here in the middle, which was done in Jena in Germany, and they found that the diversity of soil animals was also greater within the more diverse plant species mixtures. And finally, there are also benefits for soil carbon sequestration, increased carbon inputs through roots, for example, stimulation of microbial activity leads to increased incorporation of that carbon and protection of that carbon and its storage within the soil. We've also done some studies recently looking at physical properties within the soil. This is work done by Ian Gould, who's a PhD student working with John Quinton, and myself and what we did here were studies where we had variation in grassland diversity within soils of low organic matter content but also we tested soils from a field experiment the one i mentioned in Jena. we looked at aggregate stability within the soil and what we found was higher plant species richness was generally associated with improvements in the aggregate stability and hence the structural capacity of the actual soil. And this was consistent across a range of soils that varied in the field, but also in these glasshouse and in these field experiments. We also found that these effects were very strongly related to the roots and the root traits, in particular, the abundance of fine roots, which mesh soil particles together, enhancing the stability of the soil. So it seems that higher diversity within grassland systems at least, can bring benefits for the microbial communities, the faunal communities, the processes of carbon cycling, but also it brings benefits for the physical properties of the soil. As I said before, it's important to stress that we know, still need to know more about the mechanisms involved and it could be related to which species are present and the traits of the species rather than number of species per se, but all the same, it all points in the same direction that these higher diversity grassland systems tend to have improved physical, chemical and biological properties in the soil. The last thing I just want to mention about these high diversity systems is that we've also looked at the capacity to actually recreate grassland communities within exarable land, degraded exarable land, and test how that can benefit the resistance of processes within the soil. This was an experiment we did at Salisbury Plain. What we did was construct different grassland communities, mixed grassland communities of varying composition based on known information about the traits of those plants, in particular of their roots. So what we wanted to do was create a gradient of root depth variety. Like in this picture here, the more Diverse systems had more variety in terms of the depth of roots and the biomass of those roots within different parts of the soil system. We then imposed a drought, an experimental drought in the field using these, these shelters, and we looked at the resistance, i.e. the impact of that drought on soil processes, but also the recovery. 
And this is just a snapshot of the data from that experiment, but hopefully it demonstrates an important finding that increased complexity of the routing system has actually increased the resistance, in this case of nitrogen mineralization, but also other key soil processes, to that perturbation. So in other words, these more diverse plant communities with more diverse root systems are more able to buffer extreme climatic events, in this case, in relation to drought, which is increasing in frequency and intensity as a result of climate change. Now, just before I move on to the final part of the talk, which is on the grazers, I just want to make a, a simple point that, that I've talked simply about grassland systems, but it also seems that diversification practices also bring benefits within cropping systems, arable systems. And this is a, a recent meta-analysis that was done across 5,000 plus studies comprising over 40,000 different comparisons between diversified and simplified systems, mainly in arable systems. And you can see here quite clearly that if you look in the middle graph here, this is the effect size of crop and non-crop diversity. So non-crop would be diversification practices outside the actual field where the crops are growing, like hedges, for example, or feed margins, for example. But generally what they did was bring positive effects on biodiversity, pest control, pollination, nutrient cycling, water regulation, soil fertility, and also to some extent, carbon sequestration. But what they actually found in this study, it's a meta-analysis, so it's a broad range of different studies and different systems, is that these benefits also emerged without compromising crop yield. So it seems, I, I would say at least, that there is strong evidence, I would say, that diversification practices do bring benefits in terms of the functioning, and hence they could be key to regenerative agriculture. The only final thing I would say in, in terms of diversification is that effects of diversity are strongly context dependent and depend very much on the type of crops used within a system or the types of plants. But all the same, it seems that they generally lead to benefits within the system. Now, I've just got a few minutes left, so I just want to finish on a, a final note, which is when you're talking about grasslands, an obvious thing to also talk about are the actual grazers. And this is a topic I've personally worked on since I did my PhD many years ago, which was looking at how grazers influence biological processes within the soil. And put simply, there are many different routes by which grazing animals can impact on microbial communities, faunal communities in the soil, and that can have consequences for nutrient cycling and the productivity of the grassland system. Now, when you look at processes within the soil, in particular those I mentioned at the beginning, things like biodiversity in the soil, but also things like carbon sequestration, it seems quite clear that these grazes are actually critical to the functioning of these soil systems and the benefits that they bring. This was a, a study we did across a broad range of sites in the United Kingdom, or in particular in England, and what we did here was sample 180 sites and they were segregated on the basis of the intensity of management. So we had extensive grasslands with less than one livestock unit per hectare, intermediate and intensive systems, which went over two to three livestock units per hectare per annum. And you can see in the graph here that carbon stocks in grasslands are extremely high, particularly to depth, but also the highest carbon stocks were generally found at intermediate levels of grazing, at 1.5 livestock units per hectare, which was also associated with low amounts of fertilizer addition. So it seems that grazing and also associated management on intermediate grazing systems seems to bring benefits to depth in terms of the amount of carbon actually stored in the soil. In this study, which was across England, we found that to one meter's depth was about 10% greater carbon contained in the soil, corrected for bulk density, relative to intensive management. The other thing we've done recently, this is actually unpublished data, is we did a study across a broad range of upland grassland sites. So these are high organic matter grasslands across the entire range of sites from southern, southwest England right up to northern Scotland. And we looked at graze versus on graze sites at each of these locations. And we found some quite striking results. The first is that removal of grazing from these grasslands actually has consistent negative 
effects on the diversity of organisms within the soil. Across the protists, fungi, nematodes, mites, springtails, and also plants, there were negative effects on local diversity of those groups of organisms within the soil, but also reductions in the diversity of plants. And moreover, it was the rare plants and rare organisms that seemed to be affected most. So it seems that grazing is pretty critical for the diversity of life within the soil. We also looked at the effects of grazers on carbon storage. These are high organic matter soils. They're generally upland grasslands where they have high concentrations of carbon. Across all the sites, there was no significant effect. But when you look at the detail of the data, it seems that removal of grazing can have positive effects on carbon storage when the initial carbon storage is low, but in the more high organic matter soils, the removal of grazing seems to have negative effects on the amount of carbon stored in the soil. So effects of grazers on carbon storage or their removal seem to be strongly context dependent. I think this is a key challenge for the future, which is something that Anne mentioned about how we identify the best optimum systems in terms of grazing for the storage of carbon in soil. This is just one example, but there seems to be incredible variability, so there's a need to understand what those controls actually are. The final slide that I want to show, because I realise I'm running out of time, is that livestock type and diversity also seems to be important. Now, very few studies have actually explored this, but this is just one example that I want to show you. It's from grasslands in, in Mongolia, so in China, so they're very different to our UK grasslands. But what they showed in this study is that mixed grassland systems tend to promote what they call multidiversity, which is the diversity of plants and a whole range of soil organisms. And that that increase in multidiversity from a mixed grazing system of cattle and sheep brought benefits for the multifunctionality, i.e. a broad range of different functions that operate within the soil. This is just one example, but hopefully it also illustrates the need, I would say, for further evidence to really understand what the optimized grazing is in terms of bringing benefits for the diversity and functioning of our soils, both in terms of the environmental conditions, but also in terms of the type and diversity and abundance of those grazing animals involved. So just to wrap up, I realize I'm uh, coming to an end. Hopefully the key message I've said is that biodiversity, both for plant and also soil diversity, is absolutely key to restorative agriculture. I focus on grasslands, but I think the evidence also shows that it's relevant to arable systems. And the final point, which is one that Anne also made, is I think we really do need further evidence to understand the importance of grazers in these systems in terms of actually identifying the optimum management of grazing systems for things like carbon storage and the maintenance of biodiversity and function. And on that note, I'll finish and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Richard. That was incredibly interesting. Um, and I've made a few notes about the importance of this, the food web uh, and biodiversity uh, and how crucial that is to the health of our soil. So thank you very, very much. Um, I'm pleased to welcome Chris McCloskey, who's one of our early career committee members, who's been monitoring, monitoring the questions you've been sending in for our panellists. Um, we have now closed the questions. Uh, please, I, I know lots of you will have many more, but we won't have time to go through them all. Uh, we are going to run over slightly in today's webinar to around five past one, just to get through as many questions as we can, as I know we've had lots and lots come in. So over to you, Chris. Thanks, Sarah. So thanks everyone who submitted the question. We've got a lot of really good questions, so let's try and get through as many as we can. So firstly, a question for both Anne and Richard from David Lith. What are the three priority actions a grassland farmer, upland or lowland, should do to enhance or maintain organic matter levels? Well, I would say the first one is not, as I say, not cultivate what think about if you've got to reseed and rejuvenate a pasture think about how you're going to do that um that would be one of my top ones um obviously what richard was saying about diverse divert diversifies diversifying the sward could be an option um but looking at ways in which to mitigate and manage erosion as well and compaction within the grassland 
I think is also key in terms of grassland management. I don't know whether Richard wants to add some more. <laughs> Yeah, I think Anne's really covered them all. I, I, I think I, I, I would just add that um, we've done some very long term studies at some sites in the Yorkshire Dales. The, these are on particular types of grasslands, extensive grasslands. And what we find there is the actual the most important interventions for carbon storage, but also other soil properties is farmyard manure addition seems to be pretty, pretty key in, in terms of explaining variation in that it brings benefits for a range different aspects of the soil and I think the other point which I uh, hopefully made in my talk is that finding an optimum grazing uh, management is also key really uh, not not just in terms of the obviously emissions from the animals uh, and the, their waste but also in terms of the processes that lead to carbon sequestration within the soil and I think I showed you there that these mixed systems and uh, intermediate levels seem and I stress seem because uh, there needs to be more work on it, seem to have benefits for the amount of carbon in the soil. So maintaining diversity, organic inputs and uh, optimum grazing seem to be key in terms of building carbon. Fantastic. Um, a slightly later question about sources of carbon from, um, from Lee Condron. In relation to the potential role of increased inputs from organic material and the impacts on soil organic matter, surely the addition of stabilised carbon from a biochar has the potential to increase soil organic matter based on the wealth of global research? So I would say <laughs> biochar is a stable, definitely a stable source of carbon, but I hope I demonstrated that actually to get the functioning um, of soil, to improve soils, we actually biochar is good for locking up carbon and locking up and keeping it there but in terms of improving the overall functioning and feeding the soil biology more decomposable materials such as livestock manures it, it would, would appear to be more beneficial yeah i mean i i i, I agree with what, what Anne said i mean my, my impression is with, with biochar that it seems to have quite variable um effects in different systems i mean i'm not an expert on biochar by any stretch of the imagination but that's that's certainly my impression um but but to me i i, I think it, it can obviously help in certain situations and and could should be used but uh, i i would always be an advocate of, of relying on the sort of biological processes and the inputs of organic matter, which are the natural processes by which you build carbon in soil. And certainly in grasslands and arable systems, um, we've mentioned farmyard manure, for example, and waste recycling, but also just getting roots in the soil seems to be a key thing in that there's a clear evidence, I think, that the more roots you have, generally the more carbon that you have contained in the soil. So I think it has a role, but perhaps in a more uh, targeted way. And, uh, and that would require identifying the situations where it can bring benefits. I think ju just to add one thing with a lot of these uh, points is that, it, I mean, certainly, I don't know what, what Anne thinks, but my, my impression is that the, the opportunities for building carbon are very much in these lower organic matter soils. And that, that's where you really see these benefits of um, increasing diversity, adding farmyard manure, et cetera. It's at the low end of the organic matter spectrum, so soils that are already being degraded to some extent, yeah. and perhaps biochar as well is it is uh, more useful in those kinds of settings. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I'd also add that you need to think about where is the biochar coming, what was the feedstock for that biochar, et cetera, et cetera, the whole sort of carbon life, life cycle sort of analysis of that biochar. Um, uh, I, would, I would add that into the mix as well. Uh, a lot to consider there. Um, we've had a fair few questions about the economic implications of regenerative agriculture. So here's one from Edward Tate. Regenerative agriculture is key to a sustainable long-term food production. A major short-term hurdle is to good practice is financial realism. There is little premium for regeneratively agriculturally produced food and increased free trade leaves UK produces exposed. Good practice potentially costs more than potential taxpayer support. And um, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, 
I haven't looked at the economics, but if you speak to farmers who are undergoing these practices, that actually they are, in some respects, um, simplifying the system. If you go no-till, you're not using so much diesel. Um, you can simplify your kits that you're using. Um, and actually, you can save, potentially save money in terms of fuel, in terms of fertilizer use. Um, so in terms of the economics, as I say, I, I haven't done the economic analysis or looked at any, any depth, so, but I am, I, I'm, together with environmental support, I'm not convinced necessarily that it would farmers would take a hit necessarily. They may do in that first initial transition period, and often people talk about actually doing it on a more phased process so that you don't go whole scale with your farm um, and you do it field by field and think about how you're going to do it and share equipment with farmers, that kind of thing. There's, there's all sorts. Farmers are actually having a good play with this at, at, at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not... Uh an economist I, I really so I'm not sure either but I, I think I would also add add to that that um, it's like I showed you that meta-analysis before on I diversification practices across a broad range of sites in most cases not all but in most cases yield wasn't compromised through introducing these diversity um, uh, practices but you know, as Anne said as well, yeah, it depends on the whole balance of inputs and outputs to the system. So if you're reducing inputs, you know, obviously the costs are less in terms of energy and fertilizer use, et cetera, so that there could be benefits. But I guess it also depends on, yeah, the support mechanisms for farmers to introduce measures and the new markets that might emerge in terms of food products that have come from poor regenerative systems. Great, thanks. Um, so a question on grazing from Sarah Shepherd. Um, should grasslands be grazed for the diversity of grazers or browsers, i.e. cows and sheep in one field, or grazing different plants? I think that's grazers that focus on different plants. Yeah, I think, um, well, I can say a bit about that. I, I showed some data there that mixed grazing can be beneficial for plant diversity in particular, um, but also to soils to some extent, because different animals have different grazing um feeding strategies so they eat different plants and they actually excrete different amounts of nutrients but i think it really depends on the scale of the grazing enterprise for me because in in more extensive grazing systems i think mixed grazing and uh lower grazing intensities in combination can also bring heterogeneity within to the actual system and i think that's another key part of diversification and resilience is the overall heterogeneity of, of a, a grassland or moorland system for example and low grazing mixed grazing can actually assist with that i mean just a very simple thing is that uh, you know different sized animals feed on different plants and have different effects on soil but they also excrete feces which is different in its nutrient content so big animals tend to have uh, feces which is high in um, low in phosphorus content relative to nitrogen, whereas smaller animals tend to have uh, lower nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. So it also helps create diversity within the system as well. I think generally diversity is good. Yes, thanks. And uh, a, a Lynch question I think builds on that a bit um, from Matthew Tarnowski. Does the microbiome of plants and grazers significantly influence the biological, physical and chemical trajectory of the soil? I can have a go at that, yeah. Um, so you're, you're asking if the soil microbiome, if the soils and the plants basically influence soil physical properties, they all, they certainly do. I mean, they're all very strongly interrelated. So, um, you know, as Anne pointed as well, organic matter is key to soil physical properties, but also plant roots are absolutely key to building soil properties. So plant roots, fine roots, for example, and mesh that hold together soil particles. They produce microbes, produce gums or glues that bind particles together. So, you know, the more biologically active uh, a soil system is in terms of roots, in terms of microbes, uh, generally the better the structure of the soil. 
I think we've got time for one more question, Chris, if you've got one uh, to hand. Thanks. So final question from Hannah Bowley. Is comparing some values to average values the best option? If some values are generally raised across the country, then shouldn't we be aiming for higher concentrations compared to average? Is this an example of pragmatism due to lack of scientific evidence? I, I didn't quite get that, sorry. It... <laughs> sorry, I'll, I'll repeat. I think it's um, referring to some of your earlier slides, Anne. Um, so is it is... talking about soil organic matter levels in... in it is, in... yes. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, we do have to take a pragmatic approach. So um, that those, those um, as I said in my talk, we we haven't really got a critical value of organic matter, and so actually taking a sort of more balanced approach and understanding where you might fit your soil within the range of typical values for your soil type and target those those soils which are obviously outside or below their 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 typical range would be the the, the a way to guide how you would um target interventions i, I don't know whether that answers the question though <laughs> That's super. Thank you, Anne, uh, and thank you, Richard, and thank you, Chris, as well, for, for leading that Q&A session. That was an incredibly informative session, and I'm sure we'll have lots of people who want to revisit this uh, afterwards. Uh, we will be posting the video online uh, towards the end of the week, so please check out the Society's YouTube channel uh, to view this video if you'd like to see further information. Um, thank you all to our attendees for coming along and for um, uh, for being here and asking your questions. We would like to invite you all to complete the quick feedback survey when you leave today's webinar um, uh, to just give us some more information about how we're doing. Uh, finally, our next Zoom into soil session will take place on Wednesday, the 2nd of February. And as I mentioned earlier in the session, uh, we'll be on soils in Scotland. Uh, we'll also send out the link for how to register for that with the email you'll get after this session. So all that remains to be said is thank you so much, everybody, for attending. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at our February session. Thank you.